Happy Monday, May 4th. Great to see you. Thank you so much, Mitchell Mustangs, for watching another video. How did it get to be May? I have no idea, but here we are, so let's navigate it well together. This week, let's follow the same protocols, Monday through Thursday. We have Reader's Workshop. Here we are, we meet for the video, read holes together, then you independently read for 31 minutes, then do a writer's, a reader's response. And on Friday, choose your favorite reader's response. Send your score to your language arts teacher. At the very least, we would love to also see your actual writing piece, your reader's response. We check our emails all day, all of us language arts teachers look forward to hearing from you at the end of the week, so please make sure you take the time to do that. Also remember that Mrs. Clifford is doing videos to help with your readers' responses Monday through Thursday. Fantastic videos, nice and short, and they are posted right along with these videos. So take advantage of that opportunity to have Mrs. Clifford help you to be your very best and do your best thinking and writing as you do your reader's responses. On Fridays, Dr. Skeen is continuing with Writer's Workshop. Enjoy those awesome videos and all your wonderful writing. I hear that many students have written some beautiful books, so congratulations to you for participating in the writing with Dr. Skeen. Also, Please note that there are newly uploaded Writer's Workshop lessons done by your language arts teachers at Mitchell, Mrs. Bryant too. I consider her a language arts teacher even though technically she's a librarian. Check out the lessons. They're awesome, wonderful, wonderful strategies where the teachers really share their thinking of what they do as writers. So take advantage of all these opportunities this month of May. So. It is Monday. Ms. Rivero sent another riddle. Let's see if you can figure it out by Thursday. So here's the riddle. I'm made up of 12 completely different letters, but you can type me in just one. What am I? We will hear from Mrs. Rivero on Thursday. So really think about that. See if you can solve that. It's pretty great. Thank you, Ms. Rivera, for doing that. So, I was running over the weekend, something I love to do with my dog, George. And all of a sudden, I realized that I'd gone a half a mile, and I didn't really know how I got there. I just was in one place, and then all of a sudden, I just, it was like I was in a daze as I was running. And it got me thinking about how important it is for me to not do that, that I want to be an intentional runner, that I want to make sure my posture is just right, that I'm moving my legs and my arms in the right ways to make sure I don't get injured, one, but two, to make sure that I'm really getting the most of my workout, that I don't, nothing in my body misses out from that opportunity to be running and paying attention to the running that I'm doing. And this happens to me in reading sometimes where I'm reading along and all of a sudden I've read a whole chapter and I haven't been paying close attention to the text. I'm thinking about something else. It's amazing how I can read the words yet my mind is somewhere else. And I, when this happens to me, I think to myself that great readers, we know better. We know that we have to pay close attention to the text or why read? And this is just something that I invite you to think about as you do your independent reading, as you listen along with holes, of to get our minds ready for the text. And we have these different strategies, but to pay close atten attention to the text. Last week I talked about the railroad tracks, is how I keep track of flashback, the present time and flashback, and I fill in all the holes. So. To be able to do that, to use that strategy of the two rails being connected by the slats of present and past time, I have to pay close attention because I don't want to miss anything. So today, as we're reading holes, let's pay close attention to the text and let's see if we can fill in some of the holes of the story and see if we can answer some of the questions that have been forming as we're reading. So let's get started.
So we left off right in the middle of a chapter. Stanley was teaching Zero how to read. Zero nodded as if he understood, but Stanley knew he had made very little sense. He printed a lowercase a and Zero copied it. So there are 52, said Zero. Stanley didn't know what he was talking about. Instead of 26 letters, there are really 52. Stanley looked at him surprised. I guess that's right. How'd you figure that out? He asked. Zero said nothing. Did you add? Zero said nothing. Did you multiply? That's just how many there are, said Zero. Stanley raised and lowered one shoulder. He didn't even know how Zero knew there were 26 in the first place. Did he count them as he recited them? I'm paying close attention to the text. And Mrs. Clifford has illuminated that Stanley keeps raising one shoulder, raising his shoulders and lowering them. I wonder if that's important. Authors usually repeat things that are important. So see how when we pay close attention, we notice little subtle things like this that could be important. He had Zero write a few more upper and lower case A's, and then he moved on to a capital B. This was going to take a long time, he realized. You can teach me 10 letters a day, suggested Zero, five capitals and five smalls. After five days, I'll show them all. I'll know them all. Except on the last day, I'll have to do 12, six capitals and six smalls. Again, Stanley stared at him, amazed that he was able to figure all that out. Zero must have thought he was staring for a different reason because he said, I'll dig part of your hole every day. I can dig for about an hour, then you can teach me for an hour. And since I'm a faster digger anyway, our holes will get done about the same time. I won't have to wait for you. Okay, Stanley agreed. As Zero was printing his bees, Stanley asked him how he figured out it would take five days. Did you multiply? Did you divide? That's just what it is, Zero said. It's good math, said Stanley. I'm not stupid, Zero said. I know everybody thinks I am. I just don't like answering those questions. Later that night, as he lay on his cot, Stanley reconsidered the deal he had made with Zero. Getting a break every day would be a relief, but he knew X-Ray wouldn't like it. He wondered if there might be some way Zero would agree to dig part of X-Ray's hole as well. But then again, why should he? I'm the one teaching Zero. I need the break so I'll have the energy to teach him. I'm the one who took the blame for the sunflower seeds. I'm the one who Mr. Sir is mad at closed his eyes, and images from the warden's cabin floated inside his head. Her red fingernails, Mr. Sir writhing on the floor, her flowered makeup kit. He opened his eyes. He suddenly realized where he'd seen the gold tube before. He'd seen it in his mother's bathroom, and he'd seen it again in the warden's cabin. It was half of a lipstick container, K-B. He felt a jolt of astonishment. His mouth silently formed the name as he wondered if it really could have belonged to the kissing outlaw. Chapter 23. 110 years ago, Green Lake was the largest lake in Texas. It was full of clear, cool water, and it sparkled like a giant emerald in the sun. It was especially beautiful in the spring when the peach trees which lined the shore bloomed with pink and rose-colored blossoms. There was always a town picnic on the 4th of July. They'd play games, dance, sing, and swim in the lake to keep cool. Prizes were awarded for the best peach pie and peach jam. A special prize was given every year to Miss Catherine Barlow for her fabulous spiced peaches. No one else even tried to make spiced peaches because they knew none could be as delicious as hers. Every summer, Miss Catherine would pick bushels of peaches and preserve them in jars with cinnamon, cloves, nutmeg, and other spices 
which she kept secret. The jarred peaches would last all winter. They probably would have lasted a lot longer than that, but they were always eaten by the end of winter. It was said that Camp Green, that Green Lake was heaven on earth and that Miss Catherine's spiced peaches were food for the angels. Catherine Barlow was the town's only school teacher. She taught in an old one-room schoolhouse. It was old even then. The roof leaked, the windows wouldn't open, the door hung crooked on its bent hinges. She was a wonderful teacher, full of knowledge and full of life. The children loved her. She taught classes in the evening for adults, and many of the adults loved her as well. She was very pretty. Her classes were often full of young men who were a lot more interested in the teacher than they were in getting an education. But all they ever got was an education. One such young man was Trout Walker. His real name was Charles Walker, but everyone called him Trout because his two feet smelled like a couple of dead fish. This wasn't entirely Trout's fault. He had an incurable foot fungus. In fact, it was the same foot fungus that had a, that 110 years later would afflict the famous ball player, Clyde Livingston. But at least Clyde Livingston showered every day. I take a bath every Sunday morning, Trout would brag, whether I need to or not. Most everyone in the town of Green Lake expected Catherine to marry Trout Walker. He was the son of the richest man in the county. His family owned most of the peach trees and all the land on the east side of the lake. Trout often showed up at night school but never paid attention. He talked in class and was very disrespectful of the students around him. He was loud and stupid. A lot of men in town were not educated. That didn't bother Miss Catherine. She knew they'd spent most of their lives working on farms and ranches and hadn't had much schooling. That was why she was there, to teach them. But Trout didn't want to learn. He seemed to be proud of his stupidity. How'd you like to take a ride on my new boat this Saturday? He asked her one evening after class. No, thank you, said Miss Catherine. We've got a brand new boat, he said. You don't even have to row it. Yes, I know, said Miss Catherine. Everyone in town had seen and heard the walker's new boat. It made a horrible loud noise and spewed ugly black smoke over the beautiful lake. Trout had always gotten everything he ever wanted. He found it hard to believe that Miss Catherine had turned him down. He pointed his finger at her and said, no one says no to Charles Walker. I believe I just did, said Catherine Barlow. Chapter 24. Stanley was half asleep as he got in line for breakfast, but the sight of Mr. Sir awakened him. The left side of Mr. Sir's face had swollen to the size of half a cantaloupe. There were three dark purple jagged lines running down his cheek where the warden had scratched him. The other boys in Stanley's tent had obviously seen Mr. Sir as well, but they had the good sense not to say anything. Stanley put a carton of juice and a plastic spoon on his tray. He kept his eyes down and hardly breathed as Mr. Sir ladled some oatmeal-like stuff into his bowl. He brought his tray to the table. Behind him, a boy from one of the other tents said, Hey, what happened to your face? There was a crash. Stanley turned to see Mr. Sir holding the boy's head against the oatmeal pot. Is there something wrong with my face? The boy tried to speak, but he couldn't. Mr. Sir had him by the throat. Does anyone see anything wrong with my face? He asked as he continued to choke the boy. Nobody said anything. Mr. Sir let the boy go. His head banged against the table as he fell to the ground. Mr. Sir stood over him and asked, How does my face look now? A gurgling sound came out of the boy's mouth. Then he managed to gasp the word, Fine. I'm kind of handsome, don't you think? Yes. Mr. Sir. Out on the lake, 
The other boys asked Stanley what he knew about Mr. Sir's face, but he just shrugged and dug his hole. If he didn't talk about it, maybe it would go away. He worked as hard and as fast as he could, not trying to pace himself. He just wanted to get off the lake and away from Mr. Sir as soon as possible. Besides, he knew he'd get a break. Whenever you're ready, just let me know, Zero had said. The first time the water truck came, it was driven by Mr. Pendansky. The second time, Mr. Sir was driving. No one said anything except, thank you, Mr. Sir, as he filled each canteen. No one even dared to look at his grotesque face. As Stanley waited, he ran his tongue over the roof of his mouth and inside his cheeks. His mouth was as dry and as parched as the lake. The bright sun reflected off the side mirror of the truck and Stanley had to shield his eyes with his hand. Thank you, Mr. Sir, Magnet said as he took his canteen. You thirsty caveman, Mr. Sir asked. Yes, Mr. Sir, Stanley said, handing his canteen to him. Mr. Sir opened the nozzle and the water flowed out of the tank but it did not go into Stanley's canteen. Instead, he held the canteen right next to the stream of water. Stanley watched the water splatter on the dirt where it was quickly absorbed by the thirsty ground. Mr. Sir let the water run for about 30 seconds, then stopped. You want more? He asked. Stanley didn't say anything. Mr. Sirs turned the water back on and again Stanley watched it pour onto the dirt. There, that should be plenty. He handed Stanley his empty canteen. Stanley stared at the dark spot on the ground which quickly shrank before his eyes. Thank you, Mr. Sir, he said. Chapter 25 there was a doctor in the town of Green Lake 110 years ago. His name was Dr. Hawthorne, Hawthorne. And whenever anyone got sick, they would go see Doc Hawthorne. But they would also see Sam, the onion man. Onions! Sweet, fresh onions! Sam would call as he and his donkey, Mary Lou, walked up and down the dirt roads of Green Lake. Mary Lou pulled a cart full of onions. Sam's onion field was somewhere on the other side of the lake. Once or twice a week, he would row across the lake and pick a new batch to fill the cart. Sam had big, strong arms, but it would still take all day for him to row across the lake and another day for him to return. Most of the time, he would leave Mary Lou in a shed, which the walkers let him use with no charge. But sometimes he would take Mary Lou on the boat with him. Sam claimed that Mary Lou was almost 50 years old, which was and still is extraordinarily old for a donkey. She eats nothing but raw onions, Sam would say, holding up a white onion between his dark fingers. It's nature's magic vegetable. If a person ate nothing but raw onions, he could live to be 200 years old. Sam was not much older than 20, so nobody quite was quite sure that Mary Lou was really as old as he said she was. How would he know? Still, nobody ever argued with Sam, and whenever they were sick, they would go not only to Doc Hawthorne, but also to Sam. Sam always gave the same advice. Eat plenty of onions. He said that onions were good for the digestion, the liver, the stomach, the lungs, the heart, and the brain. If you don't believe me, just look at old Mary Lou here. She's never been sick a day in her life. He also had many different ointments, lotions, syrups, and pastes all made out of onion juice and different parts of the onion plant. This one cured asthma, that one was for warts and pimples, another was a remedy for arthritis. He even had a special ointment which he claimed would cure baldness. Just rub it on your husband's head every night when he's sleeping, Mrs. Collingwood, and soon his hair will be as thick and as long as Mary Lou's tail. Doc Hawthorne did not resent Sam. The folks of Green Lake 
were afraid to take chances they would get regular medicine from Doc Hawthorne and onion concoctions from Sam. After they got over their illness, no one could be sure, not even Doc Hawthorne, which one of the two treatments had really done the trick. Doc Hawthorne was almost completely bald, and in the morning, his head often smelled like onions. Mitchell Mustangs. We are going to stop there. Wow, paying close attention to the text helped us to learn some really interesting information today. So does the KB stand for Kate Barlow, the kissing bandit, the one who did not kiss Stanley's ancestor because she robbed him of his money and jewels and treasures, but she didn't kill him? Hmm. Paying close attention to text really helps us to get the full experience. Mitchell Mustangs, I invite you to pay close attention to your text as you're reading your 31 minutes today. Think about the questions that you have and that look for the answers. Think about, about if there's flashback. We talked about that on Thursday, how I envision a railroad with the two rails and the past and the present and the slats connect them, filling in the holes. And I have to pay close attention to the text to make sure that I don't miss any important information, that I enjoy my reading to the full extent. So, Mitchell Mustangs. The last thing I want to say to you is stay healthy, happy reading, happy writing. Thank you.